Hey everybody, today on the podcast we've got Will Harden from Project Echelon. Project Echelon is one of the top domestic elite teams here in the U.S. and you'll see them on the podium though also at pro races, definitely at amateur races and Will is just an all-around great guy. I met him a few years ago at a local race. We kind of kept seeing each other. He's going to school in Boone which is down the road from Blowing Rocks. We've crossed paths on some rides Ask him to come on and just talk about where he's at with racing. If you're watching on YouTube, you're going to see him in the lab. So, you know, he his racing age is 24. So I'm always curious, what do guys and women who are at that age, that stage of their life, you know, they're breaking out of grad school or maybe they've been in the, the working world for a couple of years. Where does racing fall into play for them, especially when this guy is getting killer results at small, medium and large races? So definitely a bright star in the cycling space now will only continue to get better. I'm really pumped to see what Will puts together. You'll hear about where he's going next, which is really exciting. I think it suits his writing style really well. And also maybe he goes into the research field more, but time will tell on that. Thanks for checking out the podcast. Will, thanks for doing this. Talk to you guys soon. So what I was saying is let's just do the intro and jump in because I have questions about what you're doing in the lab and like how that will, like where do you balance cycling and life and you know, you're a young dude and you've got clearly a ton of talent of kind of like, I think it's a good part of your story is you're just crushing right now. It's awesome. So um, I, last time you told me something and maybe your outlook has changed a little bit since you've been having some really good results. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I can start with what I'm doing in the lab right now. Um, we do like gut well, tell people who, who are you? Who are you first? Oh, yeah. My name's Will Harden. I race for Project Echelon um, on the elite team, and I do onboarding for them as well. We do the veteran onboarding, Hugo and I. Um, and then I'm a, also a student at App State University and a, a coach for Volosha Sport. Um, but right now in the lab, we're working on like gut microbiome and interspecies interactions with uh, b- bacteria so what is that's interesting because the i feel like we don't know as much about the gut as we're going to in the next 10 15 however many years there's so much coming out about the gut in relation to general health and then i, I want to say like autism and other things like that like what are you guys trying to hone in on there yeah what we're looking at is uh, crohn's disease model um so irritable bowel disease there are a few different strains that are associated uh with that like general gut inflammation um in more of a like chronic case so we're looking at the relation between those two different types of bacteria um but the field is yeah in a groundbreaking state right now where we're just figuring out how much our guts and the health of our guts are connected to just overall human health, which is, is awesome to be like part of that research. <laughs> I can only imagine. So what was your undergrad in and what are you in? What, what's the field of grad school or whatever degree you're getting right now? Yeah. So I, I did undergrad in biology at Lee's McRae college, which has a pretty good cycling program. Um, and then I had a minor in cycling, which was cool. That was more of a, uh, like infrastructure type minor and, um, like the politics of getting good cycling infrastructure. And then I had a math minor there too. So got the school in there. Um, and right now at App State, um, in the cell and molecular biology master's program. So you, you stay busy all the time. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta, gotta stay active. What's the, so cycling minor, tell me about this. What is the cycling, mi- what were infrastructure or tell what, um, is this like yeah, a Lee's so, McRae thing or is this other, other schools that have this or go, go in on that? It's really, I think there's only two schools that actually have a cycling minor option. Um, the other one I believe is on the West coast. Um, and they do more of an exercise science basis of cycling. Uh, but the interesting part about the Lee's McRae program is it's very, focused on legislation in cycling. You get to learn different parts of like cycling related incidents in city infrastructures and what different parts of cycling infrastructure can actually benefit cyclists and how to get that kind of stuff in the community. We did 
uh, some lobbying in Congress. Um, like we went to Washington, D.C. and lobbied with Virginia Fox and all that stuff just to make them aware of cycling infrastructure problems that North Carolina has. Um, so, yeah, it was a lot of eye-opening stuff. And then we did like an officiating class for like USA Cycling. So we got to learn a lot of the the rule books in USA Cycling too and why some of their legislation is the way it is, which I think is a pretty important topic now with our little nationals drama, right? Oh, well, I don't know if it's drama. I think there's just, there's been a lot of little birds chirping and I think... I mean, I'm going to make a post about it because I had at least five people message me and say, what do you think about this? And what do you think about, you know, Team X, Y, and Z and people racing both? I personally have no problem with it. But, yeah, I mean, have you guys heard noise about it? Yeah, it's, a, it's such a like a, a gray area where, like, on Echelon, we are an amateur team and, like, we're not – supported as pros really like we all have day jobs i think two of the guys on the team don't have a day job um so yeah we all work and i mean we don't get we don't get paid salaries um so by all definitions we are a well-supported amateur team um but we're also going to take that opportunity to race at the highest level in the pro nationals um especially because we were granted that opportunity this year and i i think we like we showed how good we are um, as an amateur team there, but yeah, the uh, the current the current state of American cycling is confusing. Yeah, <laughs> I just those. hope there's no heat coming to teams that were there because I, I you know it's like what are you gonna it's the rules hey you're there. I have my own. I mean, the the biggest thing was somebody had posted that they said Velo Brew apparently won the amateur Nats with Forrest and fifth because everyone else is a pro, and I was like, eh, dude, that's not slow your roll like you know we're not pumping that dialogue at all we're in fit and they're like no nah, nah, nah. I, like, I don't know you know everyone there was an amateur that you know you had to be an amateur to be there and whether you get to race up and do other races i think the biggest question is there's usa cycling doesn't define amateur and pro in a great way um there's a lot of different ways you can look at this. At the end of the day, I think if people want to race and go for the title, cool. I think it's, I personally think it's more of a inner dialogue that an athlete needs to have. If you, Peter Sagan's not going to show up to an amateur race because he knows that that would be a joke. If someone believes that they are an amateur and that, you know, they're on equal level, cool, come and race. The only beef I do have is when people who maybe weren't amateurs before and then they come to the race and then they talk smack on the race. Like, oh, I'm racing with these amateurs. It's, that's funny because you're an amateur now. So either shut up or don't come. Like, I sometimes feel weird going to a master's race depending on who's in the field. Like some local races I wouldn't go to unless I was trying to like double up just for like a fitness thing. But a guy one time said to me, he's like, why are you in this race? You shouldn't be here. Aren't you racing a one, two race later? And I said, well, I'm trying to race 120 miles today. And the one, two race is really short. Like, and then I go, okay, we get it. Like, I'm not just, I guess at the end of the day, you shouldn't be going just to smash people. Like that's what the group rides for. That's like, go flex on your buddies. Don't go flex on some guy who's trying to do well in the weekend or whatever. But anyways, we won't, We'll leave it at that. Um, but it, and it's, you have had, you know, such a, a really awesome rise for people that have been watching you race because um, I looked back at your results. I, we crossed paths in 2020. When was Commerce? Was that the first time we raced against each other? That's the first time I remember racing against you. I okay. think it was, yeah, 2020. Um, you were racing for Velocious still, and you later in that year, uh, guest rode, I think with project echelon, but you got your cat one in 2020, right? If I looked back and saw the results, I think you did a two, three race in 2019 and probably did well. And then, so pretty like fresh to doing all the big races, but now you only do big races. Like I would recommend people go back and look at what Will is doing. It's, um, all the big U.S. races, which is, I think, probably the best reason to be on Project Echelon, as well as being around some super talented guys to learn from. But kind of how have you seen your cycling career, we'll call it, where, where did it start? I want to say Q1 
can't remember the year, but you've done, you race a lot. I mean, you are a busy dude to hear, you know, from the school and working and racing. And I'm excited to see then where you project this because everyone kind of balances cycling in different ways. And I think it's really insightful for other athletes to hear you can do a lot and still be a really good bike racer. So that was a lot in one. Tell us how you got to here. Um, why'd you start riding a bike? Yeah, well, I was in high school. I was a football player. So I was like <laughs> inside linebacker, 200, 205 pounds, like beefed up. And I bought my bike. I saw the tour de France and I bought a bike cause I had like swim team coaching money and I, I just blew it on a bike. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to ride a bike around. Um, did some like group rides in Winston. And one of the guys was like, you know, you can race, right? I, I had no idea. Like I didn't I know no, if yeah. there were any races other than the tour de France. Right. And so I looked it up and, uh, went to Ken's bike shop in Winston. And one of the guys was like, yeah, there's actually a race tonight. So I went and did my first crit and, uh, it was bad. I, I did, like, it was a 20 or 30 minute cat four race. And I was, I don't know, 16. And I brought a bottle for this 30 minute race, like big bottle put on there. Um, went to drink it after getting dropped. I think I got a drop lap three. Um, and then put it back in, I, I dropped it. I dropped the bottle like in the middle of a crit. Um, the dude behind me hit it. And then a few corners later, I clipped a pedal and then they pulled me. <laughs> and it was, you know, that was a great oh. first experience. Um, it's gotten a little more tuned in since then, <laughs> the crit <laughs> racing. But That's a, so yeah, which, it's, it's been hectic. Are you crit racer or road racer at your love at heart? Um, I definitely train for road racing just because you can't really do just crit race like training um, and be prepared for those longer races. So I, I, I like to be prepared for the longer races, but I do like both crits and, and road races. They have such a different taste to them. <laughs> Definitely a different taste. It seems like I'm trying to think of when I scan through the results, my key does do a bunch of crits and um do you how does it work with project echelon do you do they tell you kind of like hey you're going to this race or or is it like hey this is what i'm free how structured is it because how many guys are on the team i think we have around 12 to 14 dudes okay. um yeah with with covid our schedule has been up in the air um for the past the whole time i've been on the team um just as the entire road schedule has been um but usually at team camp, we get kind of a set idea of at least one or two big races that we'll get to go to for me that year or this year. It was um, Gila or the Gila, which was the first time I'd ever gone. Uh, having that as your goal race for the first time at altitude and the first time at that race was was interesting. Um, it went well for us, but yeah, that was that was quite an experience. And then I got to do Joe Martin right after that because I had a good Gila race. Um, but yeah, almost all the races I've I've had about a week or two notice on you're actually going to this. Like always tentative on the schedule, but um, yeah, we we iron out our we iron out who's going pretty late. So that you know, it seems like that has been a a trend for a lot of athletes that I've done a podcast with. Once you get towards your level, and it's kind of like who's riding well, who's available. COVID obviously has thrown in this whole other variable. So I think it's a good segue to talk about your training. What, you know, I see, so I see you as when we race commerce, you know, if we race commerce now, I'm looking at you as a very, I'm way more worried about you. You know, I attacked Govero cause I didn't, I knew him. I was like, I don't really want to bring Matt to the line. I'm like, who's this kid? I'm like, I'll bring this guy to the line. Now, two years later, I'm, I don't really want to be with Will Harden at the finish. Um, you've already dropped me a few times. I'm like, man, that's okay. This is a totally different bike rider. What have you been up to? What do you, what's your training diet like? And um, actually, you make me laugh a lot. One of his first uh, Instagram posts about the deadlift. Do you remember this? It's a very long time ago. Yes, that was my first Instagram <laughs> post, man. No, it's not. First Instagram post is two girls. You're like, oh, my friends. Oh, I think it's the yes. second one. It's a woman deadlifting. And it says deadlift because somewhere a girl is warming up with your one rep max. And I was yeah. like, oh, that's very true for me. 
But so what are you up to? What do you, so you're training for road racing, but you obviously still want to be good at crits. What does your brain think of when for training? Yeah. So I'm, I'm the self coach. Um, and I do have during the season, um, I've got a lot of racing, so it's hard to get quality training in when you're racing every weekend. I've been racing every weekend for the past, uh, five or six weeks now. Um, so rest is a big thing (laughs) during the season. Um, in the off season, I do usually a bunch of cross races. If I can this, this year, I've got like a full calendar for cross, um, the echelons allowing me to do, which I'm excited about. And then we have our own e-racing league. Um, so those usually provide most of the intensity in the off season. Uh, I like to throw in lifting as much as I can. Um, and then long rides in the off season. It's a pretty, pretty standard, type of training yeah there's no secret sauce that's going into it um Mm -hmm. it's like base season building and then race as much as i possibly can um yeah with with deadlifting or not deadlifting but with lifting in there um including deadlifting and then some some racing in the off season if i can get some intensity so would it be fair to say mostly aerobic training and then you're racing doing hard rides when you're sort of doing it by feel or based on what the schedule dictates, which is why you would say something like there's going to be people that hear you say, wait, I'm racing so much. So I don't get quality training. Cause there's, I'm sure you talk to a lot of athletes that think their training is like April to September. And I'm like, wait, aren't you racing? It's going to be really hard to train then you're everything's months before. Or I'm sure you get calls from guys that are like, it's February. Like, all right, I'm ready to get started. I'm like, okay, you're five months late, but let's do what we can. Um, does that, is that like a accurate overview of your training? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, with the quality sessions, usually you can get like two to three a week. Right. And when you're racing two days a week, um, you have to count that as your quality session. And regardless of whether or not it is actually high power, um, the stress that you accrue through racing is significant and you've got to, you've got to like allow yourself to recover from those. But yeah, most of the training, the actual hard intervals and long distances happens out of race season and then just train as much as, as much as you can recover from while you're racing. What do you think, um, what would a basic or if you race Saturday and Sunday, what are you going to do that next week? If you have another race on Saturday, is Monday always a day off or do you do recovery rides or how would you structure that? Um, later in the season, I usually take Monday off. Um, earlier in the season when I'm a little more ready to ride on that Monday, I'll do a little spin. Um, but it's, yeah, it's really dependent. It's kind of flexible on Monday, but usually a rest day. And then sometimes you even take uh, two rest days if you, if you really need it. Like for stage racing, you've got to take significant time off after like doing nationals two weeks in a row i'm taking most of this week um to just rest and recover uh which is hard to do but it's it's pretty important to get those gains from from all the racing um and then do you do what about for nationals having both of those backs back in a weekend do you do any like overloads beforehand or did you maybe have other races going on that you couldn't do that? Or how do you look at that part of the year? Because, it, you know, the peaking thing is not talked about as much. There are obviously still articles out there, but with every athlete's different, but less and less people talk about this. And I think I'm always just curious what people think about that or how do you approach that? Yeah. So peaking is ideal. Um, when I can, I did have a little bit of an overload, before nationals and then allowed that week before to kind of recover, um, very low volume week. But then I had Harlem, uh, like a New York 60 minute crit. So that was a lot of travel. Um, and then a little bit of race intensity, but honestly, that was a really easy race. Um, but so yeah, there wasn't, there was, yeah, yeah, it was, what was mostly, what was super sketch about it? Cause you know, it's actually called um, Harlem skin scraper. That, that makes sense. Now there was so few crashing, which really? was weird. Like I didn't, I didn't see many crashes. There was a lot of pedestrians on the course and then wow. 
plenty of like people on e-bikes that snuck their way onto the course during the race wow. and people yeah people would just like take their hands off the bars and like hit each other and a lot of chopping corners all at like endurance pace and then the last few laps were hard but really it was like super easy as far as fitness goes but mentally just like getting over that you might go to the hospital with this next move that was the hardest like, the hardest part of the race honestly <laughs> oh man that's yeah I've, I've actually i've never done that one there were definitely people that travel from rochester to go down there and it was just the reputation was wild, wild scene. Um, make sure you don't get stuff stolen out of your car. And I don't know. I've never been drawn to, to crits that much to drive five hours for that. So maybe for the better. But um, what's the – so how, how would you define yourself as a rider? Because you are – you know, it, let's look at just amateur nets. Third in the road race, massive congrats. Seventh in the crit, ninth in the TT. I mean, three top tens. You're 24. Do you feel like you found, you know, you've said you train for longer stuff, but you're doing both. Do you have like a love within road that you're trying to follow or do you like being, trying to, to hit everything or kind of how do you, where are you trying to take this? That's a good question. I haven't obviously haven't specified in any particular thing in cycling yet. Uh, part of my like, development through juniors was just trying to get good at everything that I could. Um, and I, I do ask a lot of questions and try to learn from all the experience we have on the team, which is huge in the time trial, just because experience and science and having the knowledge of what goes fast um, and where you need to be comfortable in those races is super important pacing strategies all that stuff and we've got great resources on the team for that so yeah just learning learning all of it um kind of allows me to like do the best i can in everything which is cool um in the future i'll probably want to specify on something but <laughs> so far i'm my role on the team is kind of as you know a, a support rider uh just because we do have some top level talent um and when we have all the guys that come to the finish, I was sweeping for Hugo uh, at nationals in that road race. And then we just started sprinting and nobody came around me. So got third, which was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, stuff like that will kind of, the results just come in through that. And then like at pro Nats, when I was off the front and the crit, um, that was my job. Like just, just to bait them out. Right. Uh, they one of the guys shared like my heart rate file so i wasn't supposed to do anything for like the first 50 minutes of that pro race um the pro crit and my heart rate was like super low and as soon as they came over the radio they were like all right you can go to work um my heart rate shot up and just stayed there for the rest of the race once we were off the front um which yeah that's just you're just trying to do your job on the team and we've got some guys that can get some really amazing results as i think we proved the past uh the past two weeks so help them do their thing 100 percent, and i think that's you know you guys have had so many amazing results i think that leads to the confusion of people not understanding who's an amateur and who's a pro team because they see you at all these big races winning on the podium like you guys crush it is a stout stout squad for sure um when you were talking about where you need to be comfortable are you referring to time trials or what do you what Go in on that a little bit. What do you comfort among intensity of a specific race or what, what are you talking about there? Yeah, specifically there, I was talking about some parts of, uh, of time trialing. You have to sacrifice comfort for speed. Um, and that's actually like a, a big balance with a lot of different cycling activities. Like you can lean over real far um, and get in an extreme position, but if you're not comfortable and you can't do it for long, um, yeah, you've got to, you've got to manage that, um, specifically in time trialing. If you have a really extreme position, but you can't put out power, you have to understand where that trade-off starts to hurt you. Um, and at amateur nationals, part of my strategy was actually getting out of that tuck on the uphills when you're going just a little bit slower, just so that you can breathe a little more. You do sacrifice an error advantage, uh, but it's worth it if you can push the watts. Right. 
yeah, it's interesting. That course actually, I'm not going to get a TT bike. I wish I had a TT bike that I would love to just be able to try and go out and rip on that course. Cause it seems very challenging on the way back. Everybody for a while, it's getting out of that. Like gotta be slammed. Gotta have everything super aggressive. It's like, well, if you're the whole time you're thinking, man, this is really painful. You're not going to be, your brain is not thinking I'm going to crush as hard as possible. It's more in like conservation mode. Mm -hmm. What's uh, so you're coaching. Do you coach the guys on Velocious or is that a coach? I'm apologize because I don't know. Is that a coaching group or tell me more about that? Yeah. Uh, Velocious sport is they sponsor like a junior team. Um, yeah. but it's an organization, like a coaching organization. Okay. It's run by John Hamlin, who was one of my like main mentors coming up, um, through cycling. Like he was the guy that I was referred to as my first coach. Um, they were like, you need to go to this guy. Cause he knows, like he knows how to get into cycling. And he definitely pushes more of a conservative approach in racing where he's not trying to push people to get their cat one, like instantly he develops riders in a way that they can learn like the most possible. Um, so through my progression, the like kind of Winston community didn't encourage me to get that cat two upgrade as fast as I could, um, or to upgrade to cat one. Like they were trying to help me learn when to be ready, um, for those big steps. And I feel like it, yeah, it definitely helped. You've got to learn how to win before you jump into the bigger races and then just get your teeth kicked in for a long time. But yeah, he's, he's a, it's just John Hamlin and I. Um, so I only actually have two coaching athletes. Uh, one's a marathon mountain biker and the other is one of the veterans on the, on the project echelon crew. And he races crits, um, which yeah, very different <laughs> coaching yeah. both of them, but I learned a lot through the coaching, um, just the questions that they have and the different behaviors that I like recognize in myself when they do things. Um, yeah, it helps. So tell me more about that, about the different behaviors that you notice in yourself in terms of how you react to two different types of athletes or in, what do you mean by that? Yeah. I mean, I think in cycling, we all have this urge to just like keep our nose to the grindstone. Um, when we don't quite realize that rest can, you know, <laughs> give you the progression that you yeah. need. Yeah. And once I figured out how important rest is, then those weeks where I schedule, you need to take this week off. Uh, that's, that's super important, not just physically, but mentally that'll get you back into the game. I, I had like a year where I just wasn't like, I wasn't in it mentally and like I think physically that manifested into like the emotional state where I just didn't want to show up to races. And when you're on the start line, you're just like, I don't want to do this, that you're not going to win that race. Um, wow. So it's important. Yeah. To, to still love it. Right. Um, and sometimes you have to take a step back and really build that hunger for the sport. That is, I'm really glad to hear you say that because that's, I'm actually going to put out a, uh, had an athlete who was going to do the Stelvio grand Fondo while he did it. He's a strong guy. We we're going to shoot for a top 20 and came in like 44th. So out of 500 people, not bad, but not what we went for. And we were looking back at some things and I had had an inkling that he was more stressed this year. And I didn't tease out, tease that out enough. And finally, after like, it was killing me. And we were trying, like, what we compared his riding to another grand final that he did. And like, just things, something was not matching up. And he was like, dude, I've been super stressed for work. And the biggest red flag that he threw out was I never really told you, but I started feeling like I was slogging through workouts. Like I wasn't enjoying it. And I was like, dude, that is massive. Like you got to still love getting on the bike. And even if it's a dreadful VO2 max workout, you're thinking I'm going to crush this. I'm going to give this everything I have. I'm going to attack the hell of this workout. Not, Oh God, I got to go do this workout. And same thing. Like you're saying, if you get to the start line and you don't want to be there, you shouldn't be there. Like we're, we're doing yeah. something wrong. And I do, I think it's very interesting coaching different styles or uh, just as you continue to grow, you'll, you know, coach a masters ultra guy and then you'll be coaching crit guys that are looking up to you and then wrote you know i think as a coach you grow so much when you're forced to hit the pause button and really try and see this athlete for who they are and the best thing that 
helped me get better at coaching different types of people was, you know, I'm a, I like threshold workouts. I like hard workouts, but I'm trying to like get in breakaways. I'm like, that's not everybody. And when you like take away your own biases towards your own training and look at that athlete, you learn so much, like, like you're saying, you learn so much from those athletes becomes such a really eye-opening experience. I think that's one of the best things about coaching. You just get to see so many different athletes and how they work and operate and what works for them, what doesn't work for them. It's pretty cool. Um, so where, where you see with the, with the gut health, and this is kind of a random question, but I think it'll be a good segue into nutrition. It's been something I was asking one of my buddies, you know, is there anything that, you know, I think for a while, like probiotics were really popular and then you had to take not probiotic or prebiotics. And then it was like, there's different waves because I don't think we know we're, are, we're really just like scratching the surface on gut health. What do you think people, and does this change for athletes need to do to have a healthy gut? Are you doing anything like foods, nutrition wise, like anything in training types of things that you found have been beneficial or is this just still such like uncharted territory? I think there are definitely like some lessons we can learn, uh, for day-to-day health as far as getting our gut microbiome healthy, um, racing and training, you do have to eat a lot of refined carbohydrates. Um, and we don't know what those are going to do in the long term to our gut health. And we won't know that for, for a while because I, I don't think there's a lot of funding in the research on athletes and their specific gut health needs because we don't have a lot of problems. We, we're generally pretty healthy. Um, but yeah, nailing, nailing the basics when you're not on the bike, um, getting like a wide variety of, of foods with fiber in them. Um, a lot of plants just like yeah, as much different types of fiber as you can that really feeds the gut microbiome. Um, but I think, yeah, figuring out what works for each individual and how you can have like a diet that's as close to, to whole non-processed foods as possible while still fueling your training. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty key. And I think gut health, I'm not a dietitian, um, but I do appreciate the science of it. And I, I encourage a lot of people, like if, if you're interested in this, go look at actual scientific articles um, or find some good resources like uh, nutritionfacts.org. That's probably my favorite one. Cool. Um, he's just got a lot of great resources. That's all like science-based. Uh, so look at, look at the science. Yeah. Cause I read, you know, I look at like the bottle of kombucha that I'll drink, which I got off of it because I have a very obsessive personality. So I drank kombucha back in 2011 or whatever. And so we were getting ready for tour of cat skills. And I was like, starting to crush kombucha. I love the fizziness. I'm like, this is amazing. I think I <laughs> drove up to a buddy's parents' house where we were staying like five hours away. This was upstate New York. This is way back in the day. And it was going to be, it's a pretty brutal stage race, but I had five of them on the drive. I was up all night, super sick. And I don't know what I did to my gut, but I was in his parents' bathroom just the whole night. And I was like, man, this is going to be the worst race. I almost didn't race. Did okay in the TT because it was 20 minutes long. And then I just had like nothing in my body. So I was crushed for the weekend. So after that, I cut kombucha out. So very recently, actually maybe two years ago, I started making it on my own. I'm like, yeah, this might be kind of sketchy. You know, I've read some bad stories about things that have happened on like people's homemade kombucha. So I started buying it again. And just got me thinking like all these live cultures and I forget what I saw that just, you know, again, talking about the gut and the brain. And so I guess if you don't, I guess, how do you know if you have a healthy gut? Like if you don't, if it's not, something's going wrong, can we assume it's healthy or is there, yeah. I mean, if you're shaking your head, yes. Or is there a way to like supercharge the gut or is it to just eat healthy foods? Yeah. The, uh, it, it doesn't, yeah, it takes a while to get it like your gut ch- composition changed. Um, but yeah, it really starts with just eating the right foods. The thing that the bacteria do is they, they flourish on, on fiber, or if you're like not eating fiber, a different bacteria will grow, um, that eats like say what it, whatever else you're eating. Um, so bacteria consume the things that our body can't right. Um, 
So fiber makes it farther into our intestinal tract and then feeds good bacteria. Um, yeah, so the more fiber you can get in, that'll change your gut composition. Um, and this is all like tentative science right, right here, but this is all where it's pointing um, from what I've seen. Uh, it's just, yeah, get a lot of fiber in and then it, it outcompetes the bad bacteria in most okay. cases. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm super fibrous with lots of fruits and veggies, so... I'm going to consider that box checked. Yes. Absolutely. What's it definitely makes me wonder when, as I look at like an eight pound thing of Malto and I'm like, man, what is that doing to my body? But what's uh nutrition wise for cycling on the bike? What are you doing? What is What works best for you? Um, you made the comment about not bringing a bottle or bringing your bottle to your first crit. Do you go zero bottles during the crits? Uh, no, usually. So like a 60 minute crit, um, if you're well hydrated that day, usually just one bottle, throw it back. Anything longer than 90 minute crits, usually a two bottle crit, depending on the heat and dryness of the day. Um, yeah, I, I try to do like a bottle and a half per hour in road races and then anywhere from 90 to 120 grams of carbs in road races. Um, getting that through, we have SIS as a sponsor, so they've got beta chews, which is maltodextrin chews and then maltodextrin gels. And then they have the normal energy gels that have like 20 to 30 grams per gel. So a mix of those just to kind of keep your mind fresh with the eating mm -hmm. thing. Cause you do still have to get it down. What's uh, being in the Southeast a bunch and well, you're all over the place in a lot of hot places, sodium, what are you looking at? Are you salting your foods more? Are you doing a lot more in your bottles? How does I feel like there's been more kind of uh, attention brought to that, which is much needed. Do you, are you winging it? Are you pretty precise with it? How does that fall into play for you? Yeah, it depends per race. Um, I'd say I eat like a normal amount of sodium in a day. I'd always like to cut back while I'm not competing. Um, but during races, I usually try per bottle to look for f like five to 600 milligrams of sodium um, in a bottle. That seems to work for me with my sweat rate. I, I hear it's different. People sweat different rates of salt. Um, so you've got to tune that into how much salt is released in your sweat. Um, I know some of our guys get like a gram of salt per hour, which is, is pretty intense. Um, but whatever can stop you from cramping or, you know, getting dehydrated in those races. Um, and that a seems to be five to six or a gram of sodium because two different things. Sodium. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's aggressive. Wow. I've definitely had, so I like salt my own Malto. And so I've been like mm -hmm. a little heavy on the pour before I'm like, Ooh, that's, that's a lot, but I just kind of rolled yeah. it. I figured it's better than not enough. Yeah. I, I've tried to just salt foods a little bit more and make sure my mix has salt in it, sodium in it, and knock on wood, don't have a cramp issue. And um, yeah, it's, I'm, I'll be really excited to see in 15, 20 years, what else we're talking about in terms of cycling nutrition since not too long ago it was, oh, 60 grams of carbs is enough an hour. And now we're like, eh, try doubling that. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> what, what other rocket fuel? What's, um, what's coming down the line for you for the rest of the season now is a little break with all the nationals behind you. Yeah. Yeah. A little week off and then get some, uh, get some good riding in. And then at the end of August, like the 19th or 20th, I'm headed to, to Belgium to go do some cremesses. Uh, we're doing a one day UCI race called parent cheese on the 24th of August, which yeah, it's going to be my first time in, in Europe. Um, what? I'm sure we'll get a lot of lessons through that. Oh man. So who's going, how many guys are going over there and how are you guys just doing the one race or what's give us some more details on this. This is exciting. Mm -hmm. So we're splitting up groups, me and, uh, Peter Olenicek, we're doing kind of a, a privateer calendar. You could call it where we're doing parent cheese and then we're just finding our own kermesses for the rest of uh, the time we're there. How before we, we be fly there? back out we'll be there until the third yeah so july july 19th until august 3rd okay um which yeah will be a good time in the kermesse calendar 
to, to get some racing in and just race as much as we can. And then another group of guys, I think we've got four or five other guys that are doing um, KB elites, which is a road stage race over in, I think France. Um, but yeah, they're doing a full stage race after parent cheese, which is what we did in Belgium last year when we sent a group there. Um, and they had a pretty wild European racing experience. So I'm sure they'll, they'll be able to replicate that this year. <laughs> How did that go for them last year? Um, it was, I think it was all right. They, yeah, they came back and they all seemed to be having fun. It's just such a different like culture of racing. Um, I think the attitudes are different for those guys. Just, yeah, it's, it's a different culture. Um, a few of our guys did really well and yeah, we're going back. So they clearly liked it enough to recommend yeah. it a second time. What it's, was uh, what was the biggest comment about the racing? Like what's, what it, did they see as different or what was their experience like? Zimmer, I've talked to Zimmer, Matt Zimmer a lot about this um, because he was, he was doing great over there. I think he got uh, like 11th or 12th in one of the days. Um, and he, I think he was racking up 350 TSS per stage and they did, I don't know, five days of that. Um, so that's some pretty intense racing. Uh it's a lot of, it seems to be a lot of just full gas all the time. Like you're racing those last five laps of a crit. It's just for 150 K, um, which seems like my kind of racing. Um, I'm excited about, excited about that style. Oh man, that's going to be wild. That is going to be so wild. I think that is right up your alley. I mean, you're yeah. in, it seems like you've got the skill set of being able to do the crits, do slight 150. So 80, uh, how far is that? 60 that's yeah, like 90 miles yeah around around 100 mile races um cool. there there are a lot of circuits over there and the parent cheese races it's got a, a cobble circuit which will be cool that, are you excited for that yeah yeah i love uh i love like gravel races and stuff the the mixed surfaces are pretty fun and up here in boone we get plenty of opportunities to race on non-roads so you didn't bring up gravel until now. So is that on your, what are you doing? Any big gravel races? Or I mean, are there gravel rides that you're doing in Boone or actual races? I know there's the one, the bootlegger it's called, right? Yeah. Point? Um, My gravel schedule is like a little tentative right now. I only did Belgium Waffle Ride this year. Uh, next week or in two weeks, there's a race called Gravelacha, which I did last year they've got like a cat one gravel climb in it and a lot of gravel up in virginia so i might see if i can go do that again uh but mainly just belgium waffle ride for this year and then i might do belgium waffle ride michigan too we're sending some guys to um steamboat which i was going to try and get in on that but the schedule might not work out on that one but yeah gravel is awesome um the races are the races are always wild and the course is so hard What's gravel uh, like? Is it technical? Is it? It's a uh, gravel. No, it's it's a lot like the roads we have up here in Boone. Um, yeah, they're not. It's not crazy gravel. You do have some gravel descending, but I'd say Belgium Waffle Ride, North Carolina, was a little more technical than than gravel is. Yeah, most of the stuff is. Yeah, there's plenty of road, and then most of the gravel is uphill, so it's mm. not. This sounds like a gravel race that's up my alley because I've watched some videos. I think it was Kerry Werner's, maybe it was Belgian Waffle, North Carolina. I'm wa you know when you watch someone's GoPro, it doesn't look that fast. I was watching his GoPro and I'm like, this looks fast. That scares me because that means it looks way faster for him. And yeah, I need I like I need like a gravel world. It's there's no real descending. It's pretty straightforward gravel it's just long it's a hard day you would crush it gravel worlds you should do that race it's um i'll look into it i've heard it's cool super fun lincoln is way cooler than i thought it would be in nebraska the guys that won the run the race are awesome it seems like a lot of the bigger names are coming back uh they sort of had everybody there and then steamboat came out and now there's some coming back and i think they might be on different weekends now but I'm considering trying to get there this year. I just, this has been a messy year. So I'm actually just not going to plan anymore this year and just see what happens. And that might work out better for me. But if you, for the future, you should do that. It's super fun course. Um, 
And it's not, even though it's 150 miles, you do it in like seven hours. It's fast. So, yeah. Um, yeah. My first gravel race was a Croatan buck 50, which is like 150 miles, but pan flat. Um, yeah. So we got it done in right about seven hours, which was ridiculous. That was the longest ride I had ever done. Nevertheless, racing it on gravel. is kind of wild. That is wild. There's one here and I don't know if they've had past couple years down in Florida, sugar cane, 200 Ted King's done it before. Um, I think that one's pretty fast, especially for the distance. Cause it's just so flat here, but I kind of want to do that at some point. Um, if it's not super sandy, I've been in some sand pits and that's not, not a good look with me, but What's so? What's your big goal with cycling? So, well, career-wise, you're in a lab. What are you trying to do over there, or where? How did like you're this really good cyclist? Are you trying to maybe make that become something? Or are you just taking it day by day? Where's Will Harden? Where are you going in the next two years and five years? This is a fantastic question. Um, <laughs> right now, just with everything, everything's like up in the air. Um, like the cycling world, it's, it's hard to like judge progression. So you just got to take all the opportunities that you possibly can. Um, what do you mean? I by seem that? to have a pretty, what's that? What do you mean by that? Not to cut you off hard to judge progression. Yeah. And, uh, in cycling, a lot of your progression is results based, right? It's not, it's not necessarily the physical progression you're having just because you can be the strongest guy there and still lose the race. Um, if you race it poorly, uh, I feel like my personal progression has been fairly linear. Every, every year I seem to get a little better, regardless of if my power is getting better. Um, I just try to learn everything I can and then just get just a little better every year. Um, and hopefully that doesn't plateau anytime soon, but just there taking all the opportunities I can and, and racing the best I can um, in cycling and, and seeing where that takes me. I do love the program I'm in right now. The guys in there are pretty awesome. We've got a great community too. Um, so I've got some more growing to do on this team. Um, and the team's growing with me. I feel like we're, we're both in a, in a pretty good like lock step as far as progressing through the sport. Um, and I, I love the guys. And then in my career development, I want to go into research just because I love it. Um, it's, it's possible that I'm applying for PhD programs for the next year. Well, I am applying for PhD programs, but we'll see how the availability is of, of like my schedule there, just because all throughout college, I've been trying to keep my racing schedule intact while also being in school and PhD programs are very demanding on everyday life. Um, luckily with research, it's a lot of flexibility. Uh, so here I can, I can do the research and then still make it to races on the weekend or take a week off and somebody else will cover like, the little steps that I need to get done during the week. But yeah, I, I do have a passion for research and you can only do cycling for so long before you've got to, you've got to find a career path that isn't, you know, racing your bike specifically, whether that be coaching or, yeah, that's actually, that's one thing I was going to ask you. And that's kind of why I asked you that is there's so many way, you know, kind of from the first thing we said, people are like, what is, what is pro these days? There's gravel, there's this, there's that. I asked one guy, younger kid, he's uh, actually probably about your age. He's on a pro team in the U S. So we were riding when I says, what's your goal, man? He's like, I just want to make money and be cycling somehow. I'm like, cool. That's great. Cause there's more ways to do that than ever now. If you had to choose research, if you had to take a flyer right now and you either they're like, you're going to this PhD program and you're not racing anymore with Project Echelon or you're going to keep racing and see what you do and forget the research. Can I put you on the spot? Which one, what would you do right now? Yeah, I think uh, right now I'm, I'm young enough and, and maybe dumb enough to take the, the cycling. You know, if somebody were to give me a sustainable way to do that for a few years, I'd finish my master's obviously, but yeah, I'd, I'd go for the bike racing for sure. You're clearly a super smart guy that I think you'll realize at some point there's a million ways to make money and survive and be really happy doing it. And, you know, even though in that hypothetical scenario, I mean, the research, there's always probably a chance to go back and do more of that. But I, I mean, <clears throat> man, linear, you say your progression is linear, but I look at it as like, 
I mean, dude, you just came in third in amateur nats, which is maybe doesn't maybe doesn't seem like a, as big of a deal, I think, to you since you're racing with a lot of guys that are racing at a higher level and you're doing those races with them. But I mean, it's a pretty awesome result. And then you're backing it up with like the biggest stage races in the US. You're 24. It's like, man, where are you going to be in three more, three, imagine three more years of training under your belt and all this experience you're getting from these guys. Like, it's pretty awesome. I hope you feel that way. I like, I'm sure you're proud of yourself, but, and I'm just N of one, but dude, it's freaking awesome to watch. You are crushing. And I think, the people that know you're like, man, this is a good dude, you know? So keep doing what you're doing. Appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. It's, um, yeah, it's always nice to, to cross paths with people that you're like, well, if I had to lose to somebody, I guess Will's not that bad. I mean, man, I will say when we were at, uh, Carter County. So who's the guy you did gravel at you with? He was in the break with us. Michael Bissett. Yeah. So I didn't know Michael, but I had heard about him. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to this climb with this guy. This is a bad idea. But he did not look good. He, I don't even know if he drank a bottle that day. He was like dying. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm like, all right, this guy, we'll get rid of this guy. Yeah. It was you, me, and who was the fourth guy? It was somebody else. Um, I think Spencer Miller was with us. Maybe. And I don't know him. Kelly Benefits. Okay. And then we had just raised Commerce. I was like, ah, oh, well, he's good. But I'm, like, I'm thinking I'm like, I'm probably not going to get to the top of this hill before we get caught by the Peloton. But I did not. I would not have taken the bet that I was the first guy to get dropped. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, that climb, you and Michael took off and I was like, Oh, that was, I didn't see that coming. And so that was the first race. I'm like, man, maybe this guy will is uh, like, you know, cresting or, or getting faster, like at a pretty rapid pace. I didn't realize how young you were. I figured you were pretty young because uh, your team just seemed on the younger side of guys. Um, I knew the other guy who I don't, I can't remember his name. He's on Kelly benefits. Now he raced with us at commerce, but anyways, I was like, okay, just got totally smoked. That was a good, good finish. And then you got to do the project echelon thing. And so, man, it's just been awesome to watch. And I know I'm looking forward to seeing what's next. And I mean, who knows, maybe you won't be at amateur Nats cause you only do them pro Nats. And, but you've definitely got a chance at winning there again, when you're, I don't think as many people, I mean, people in the race will realize this, but when your role is a sweeper and you're not the guy and you're on the podium, that's pretty cool. So, um, yeah, keep crushing, man. What else did we miss anything that we should talk about for the people to hear from you or any closing words about training, racing, anything? Uh, I don't know that we missed anything. I'd say like, yeah, one of the biggest parts of my, like journey in cycling has just been sustainability. It's like, how can you keep racing your bike? Um, so I think that's pretty important to, to nail home. Just like find something that's sustainable and that you enjoy. Dude, that's really good. I think consistency in the game is like a really underrated thing that I've noticed more people. And maybe it's just because I talk to more people now. So this could be a bad sample size, but more people will get into cycling and then because of a lot of this like get fast in nine months stuff that's out there after they do that and then they race a little bit and they're like year and a half in like oh, i'm at my i'm at my best i'm and i'm kind of not really loving this x y and z so i'm gonna go do something else I'm like damn you're like just getting started i talked to somebody that we were talking they're three years in and i'm like dude, don't take this the wrong way. But like this is endurance sports. It takes a long time to become your best and just keep going. It's, it was very interesting how you said, maybe your power hasn't gotten better, but you're getting better results. It's like, you just learn, you get the depth and you get obviously the experience, but it's um, Larry Warbass was on the podcast and he was just like, you just keep getting faster. It's like my FTP hasn't changed, but I'm definitely faster. And it's, I, there's just some of those, there's not a metric for, every, for everything that goes into endurance sports. And I just hope that more people think about their training and can I do this? Can I keep doing this? And am I having fun doing this? And like the guy I was saying with the grand Fondo, that's not sustainable. When you're slogging through workouts, you're going to be out of the sport in six months because you hate it. Why would you keep doing that? That sounds horrible. So, man, I appreciate really you. They're rarely overnight successes in the sport. Like everybody yeah. at the top seems to have been doing it for eight to 10 years. And the longer you stick at it, yeah, that consistency is key.
And I honestly, when I started looking through where you've been, how, how many races you've done by the time you're 24, I get a little envious. I'm like, man, I wish. So you started riding, you started racing when you were eight, 17, 18. Uh, yeah, I think I was around 17. I might, yeah. might even been 16, uh, which like, is like relatively late compared to a lot of people. Well, that's crazy. so, this is, and I was curious, yeah. I don't ever like to bring it up because, you know, people that are riding at your level, you do have that like, well, I'm kind of old. I'm looking at, I mean, dude, I'm 40 this year. And so it's like, yeah, you're like, damn, you're really old man. Like, you should probably hang it up. But I look at a guy who's 24. And when I think of what pro is and what kind of career you could make, I wish I could go back to when I first started riding. So I was 27, 26, first get a bike and do like a guy like vegan cyclist. I know he's a polarizing guy that I'm, I don't love everything he puts out. But the guy started just documenting him as a cat five, as a cat four. He made some cool videos. Da, 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 da. I would love to have documented like, I mean, I think everybody that does anything in cycling looks back at their first race and they're like, or first ride, first bike. It's like, wow, I didn't this journey. Like, I can't believe I've gone to where I've gone. You don't compare yourself to anybody else, but look at your own journey. It's pretty, that's what I love about endurance sports. I tell yeah. every athlete, I'm like, I don't care where you go in coaching with me, just keep growing. Like this, you're going to love where you go if you keep doing this for five, 10 years. But I think just while you might be quote unquote old in terms of like UCI road athletes. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. But at the same time, there's so many ways to achieve so many amazing things on the bike and you never know where it's going to take you. I'm actually getting sucked into going to the track tomorrow night for my first time. And I'm like super nervous. <laughs> so I asked the guy, I was like, dude, how many people are going to be there? Cause I've, I used to ride a fixie a bunch for training, but I've never been around other people. So like, well, don't worry. You don't get to go on the track the first, well you do, but you have to like ride around the, I forget what it's called. I'm already you have to get training. certified. I'm getting certified. And then they yeah. have a motor pacing session that they said they think I might be able to do. I don't know. We'll see. That's awesome. But yeah. That'll so be I'm exciting. Ex I'm excited. My road, my, so I came back from amateur nets. I got rear-ended. My road bike is cracked. So I'm kind of riding it endurance pace, but I can't go hard. And so my friend's like, dude, come smash the track bike. And I was like, this is the one, this is my motivation. I can't go hard. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. So we'll see. Maybe I'll be going to Masters Track Nats uh, next year. But, That's awesome. Dude, thank you for doing this. I appreciate you taking the time. You're clearly yeah. super busy. And um, you're going to be in Belgium when I'm back in North Carolina. But when you when do you come back? So you come back at the beginning of August? Or, Who knows? Um, you I may be going there. to Littleton. Uh, no, okay. I might be going to Littleton to do the ACC crit out there. Um, we're trying to figure out the squad we're sending uh, as we support Monk in his uh, like green jersey in the American okay. Criterium Cup. Uh, so, yeah, we're we're getting to do plenty of racing late in the season, which is yeah. exciting. But, yeah, some somewhere around the first week of August should be back. All right, man. We'll link up, either do a gravel road ride, something. I might be down to just a gravel bike and a track bike by then. So who knows? Nice. Let's do it. All right, man. I'll talk to you later. Have a safe trip over there and we'll be following along and I'll post your Instagram and all that other stuff uh, in the show notes. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you. You have a great day. You too, man. I'll see you.